Well, good. Well, friends, thank you for joining us. Um, for those of you who are maybe new to Zoom, maybe there are still folks that are new to Zoom. I don't know, um, but we just we will use Zoom as our platform for these conversations. Um, please feel that you can provide um, comments in the chat feature. If you have a question for either our presenter or I, who I will joyfully introduce to you all very soon, please feel that you can do that. We'll display a couple poll questions and a couple of slides just to kind of help get an assessment of who's all in the room with us in this conversation around assessment. And then it's so meta, isn't it? <laughs> An assessment around assessment. Um, and then if you have a, a question that maybe you're not comfortable sharing with the group, if you want to private message that to me, um, you're welcome to do that. And I will share that anonymously. Um, we have a note too that um, just to not allow everyone to come off camera or come on camera or microphone just because of the time allotted to us and the number of people. But um, certainly if you feel like you want to turn your cameras on, it's, sometimes it's nice to facilitate two faces instead of black boxes with white text names, um, then please feel that you can turn your cameras on as well. We do like to offer a land acknowledgement as at the start of all of our leadership programs and thinking about the ways in which we honor the people that came before us and how they treated the land, the sky, the sea, and the um, fens and furry friends that came with them. Um, I'm joining from the Champaign, Illinois area which was the land of Kickapoo and Potawatomi First Nations. Um, and I think it's important as leadership thinks it's important to, um, to honor and acknowledge those people that came before us um, and the, um, the land that they treated and how they treated and left it to us in that time. So I ask that you be mindful of the spaces where you're joining from today as well. If you're new to leadership, if this is your first foray into a leadership program, I thought I would share that leadership's vision is a just, caring, and thriving world where I'll lead with integrity and a healthy disregard for the impossible. It's impossible to say that without a smile, I find, because what a hopeful place to be in. Um, our mission then is to transform the world by increasing the number of people um, who do those things, who lead with integrity and a healthy disregard for the impossible. And so if you're new to the leadership community today, we welcome you into that um, community of folks that are helping us to do that work. So thanks for joining us. And if you're not new, thanks for joining us as well. We're happy to have you. We know that there are plenty of definitions of leadership out there. This is the definition that we ascribe to in the programs that we do. So I will offer this to you that leadership, leadership involves living in a state of possibility, making a commitment to a vision, developing relationships to move that vision into action, and sustaining a high level of integrity. Effective leadership takes place in the context of a community and results in a more equitable society. I kind of like to think of this as leadership's Pledge of Allegiance of sorts. We talk about this so often that it sounds like it's just something that we all know and talk to so much in the work that we do. And we're glad to be able to use this as a lens um, as part of our conversation here today. As I said in my introduction, I'm Abby Prince, the director, well, currently the director of program quality and management, moving into a new role at leadership in the coming weeks. Um, and I'm really excited to be joined by Dr. Kristen Salente Skindal today from the Aspen Institute um, and joining us on this conversation on impact assessment, which is more than a checkbox. Um, so, Kristen, if you'd like to inter introduce yourself and kind of take over from here. Yes, thank you so much, Abby, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I have to admit, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm using my physicality as a data point to assess my own well being in an extra meta way, Abby, to get started. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, I thought it would be helpful to sort of frame actually the one after that. The um, my position, oh, can we go forward and then go backwards? Yeah, sure, sure. So I'll start with my positionality, which I think serves as a good introduction, and then we'll work backwards on the. Um, polls that we have set up for me to get to know who's with us a little bit today. As Abby said, my name is Kristen Skendel. I use she, her pronouns. I join you from Hyattsville, Maryland on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people. And my journey has taken me through the United States to uh, bring me to where I am now with the Aspen Institute. I also have an appointment at the University of Maryland in the Student Affairs Concentration, where I teach actually assessment, evaluation, and research in the fall, and then our practicum course in the summer for our master's students in that program. 
My family are from um, upstate New York and Long Island, and my New York roots hold strong, even though I haven't lived in the Northeast for 25 years. And then um, this is much like what my story looks like on day one of the Institute in our family clusters. And so uh, it's a little bit linear, which is how my brain works, but also I think tells the story of my perspective and biases that I bring to the work. Um, my bachelor's degree from William & Mary is in sociology and history. And it was through that work that I really came to know and understand critical theoretical approaches from a sociological lens and the roles of context and power in how that shapes how I see the world. Um, that uh, bachelor's degree, I was an RA, I was involved in various orientation programs and service learning, a sort of highly involved undergraduate student, which led me to understand that a career in student affairs was an option, um, not something that I knew existed, which then brought me to the University of Arizona where I did my master's degree. I was reflecting to Vernon and Abby as we were prepping that my introduction to assessment actually came at my first professional association conference, the ACPA in Long Beach in 2002, where Vernon was the convention chair. And I was in a eight hour pre-convention workshop on learning outcomes and assessment while my colleagues were in a half day uh, pre-conference workshop on joy and balance in life. And so our lunch conversation was very interesting, but that framework really helped shape how I approach my work throughout my entire career, grounding me in the idea of um, learning interventions and how can we be able to tell the story of the work that we're doing that, to best serve the students. Um, my uh, career then brought me to DC where I've been ever since working at Georgetown. And then I came to the University of Maryland for both my graduate degree and to work in leadership and community service learning. Along the way, I have been blessed to be involved with the Leadership Institute as both a, a facilitator for a national session and a co-lead facilitator at many campuses. And um, also worked with Vernon at ACPA in a full-time capacity where we got to do this kind of work in a very different way and had a short while with the Institute for Education Statistics out of the US Department of Education. So again, lots of um, work in and around this idea of assessment, evaluation, and research, which brings me to where I am now at the Aspen Institute, where I am the senior manager for our youth leadership research and impact team. So the idea of evaluation and assessment are really central to the work that I do. Um, and in my teaching of the assessment evaluation and research class, it's my hope to inspire folks who are new to their this work, that this is really part of what we do and how we show up in spaces and thinking about the ways that um, we can use assessment evaluation and research as a, a tool for change, as an opportunity to challenge the status quo, as a way to provide meaningful experiences to students and to really lead with integrity in the work that we're doing. So with that, brief introduction. Oh, and there's a picture of my family, just because I think that's something that also informs who I am as a parent and a partner. And um, recently, I was in a session where Dr. Darren Pierre facilitated a wonderful conversation with youth. And he really reminded us, me, that um, the way we show up in spaces is informed by, yes, where we work and what we do, but also who we are. And so my role as a mother and a parent is something that is also really central to how I engage in my work. So with that, I think now we can do the polls, if that works. Yeah. Abby. There you go. Here's our first poll question. So I wanted to what get a sense. Your... Yep. Go ahead, Abby. No, I was just going to read the poll question yep. in case it wasn't displaying it for people. What's your comfort level with assessments? Got, most people have responded to that. It looks like everyone has responded to that question now. Nice job, y'all. So I'll go ahead and end, end that poll and display, share those results with you here. All so right. most people have a nice comfort level. That's nice to see that. That's great. And it's also okay. I'm really leaning into like right now, I feel very uncomfortable, but I am finding comfort in discomfort as well. So great. We have people who are comfortable. Let's go to the next one. Okay. What is your experience level with assessment? Assessment is such a broad category too, right? Like this could mean 
the BuzzFeed quizzes on which Shit's Creek character you are, or it could mean <laughs> lots of different um, assessments can happen within this category. Okay, we've got, it looks like maybe one more person to respond. Okay, we'll go ahead and end that poll here and I'll display those results. All right, great. Yeah. Well, this is wonderful. So we have quite the range of folks um, mm -hmm. level of experience and comfort. And um, maybe we'll start with just some quick definitions to frame how I'm thinking about assessment. And the first is, um, you can go to the next one. That's great. I okay, think sorry. most folks are familiar with this image and thinking about the, um, oh, I love that, Mike. It's uh, <laughs> fantastic. Um, so for me, assessment, evaluation, research are interchangeable, but also very separate. And the differences are important and yet nuanced. So it's sort of like for me, all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. And so all research includes assessment and evaluation, though it is in a much more rigorous and systematic approach. And I, I mean that across paradigmatic lenses, which we'll get into in a little bit. So mm -hmm. it's not just um, one quantitative approach is not the only way. And I think that's really important for the idea of impact assessment and what this looks like. Um, evaluation it is a form of assessment that often involves some judgment. There's some decision-making often uh, affiliated with evaluative work. And then assessment is really broad. And so it can be formative or summative. It, it is an opportunity to sort of um, gather, analyze, and interpret evidence that can describe effectiveness. And certainly assessment is both an art and a science, and it is highly political as we think about the many ways that uh, we engage with various stakeholders. Um, and Kelsey, I feel that too, the different types of assessment I'm doing, certainly my comfort level varies. And that's okay, we are all learners in this space. Mm -hmm. And so in thinking about um, the typical assessment cycle that you see on the screen. This is from a popular textbook from the um, 2009, I think. So we have mm -hmm. the assessment cycle. If you Google image the assessment cycle, you'll see something that looks a lot like this. It's a circular process that looks like you could check the middle off, right? You're going to establish your learning outcomes. Um, then you'll have some sort of learning intervention that might occur, and that could be a program like the Leadership Institute. Maybe you're having that on your campus or a catalyst session where maybe it's a one-time experience, or it could be something like at Maryland where you might have the Terrapin Leadership Institute, a six-week program. And so there's a variety of ways in which our learning opportunities exist. It could be a course on leadership. And then mm -hmm. you'll assess your student learning, and we'll talk about the various ways we can do that. Then you take your data, and then you start over. A limit, I think, of this approach is that you don't see change that happens as a result of your findings, that the, the circle in this image, I think, is a limited model. And so, Abby, if we go to the next slide, a concept introduced to me, a new way of thinking about the assessment cycle from our friend and colleague, Sophie Tollier at University of Maryland, is really that it's more of a slinky. And I tried to find a better image of a slinky to sort of pull it apart a little bit, but maybe not surprisingly, there are not many open source slinky images readily available. <laughs> um, so if we think about the assessment cycle as a slinky, we still have some of the similar concepts, right? We're going to establish our learning goals, our learning outcomes. And again, we, we can have some conversation on the nuance between outcomes, goals, objectives, in my head, they are different, of course, but they're sort of that similar umbrella. What, what do we want to accomplish as a result of this experience? And then the intervention, then we'll have our data collection. And then this is where from the previous slide, we have the difference. So a, slurky, a slinky is circular, but we continue to evolve the slinky. And so ideally, assessment in our practice helps us to adjust our intervention in response to the data that we collect. And again, I'm using the word data very broadly in thinking about multiple ways and multiple sources of data. So I think traditionally when I've been introduced to assessment, 
the, um, the typical framework is there's a pretest that you have your intervention, there's a post-test, and those data come in through some kind of survey form or rubric, potentially. Those are certainly wonderful resources for assessment. But there are many other ways we can think about the impact of learning that happens. And sometimes that happens immediately after the intervention, and sometimes it happens years later. I actually was recently thinking about my own learning as a resident assistant in college 20 plus years ago. Um, and the learning I had applied happened when I was a new parent and I had a toddler who was sick in the middle of the night. And I thought, my goodness, being an RA really prepared me for this skill right now of being alert, being calm, knowing what to do. Um, and that was not something that I would have uh, thought about at an earlier phase of life in my learning. Um, that's a, a sort of silly example, but certainly there are many ways where students may be introduced or participants are introduced to a learning intervention, particularly related to leadership. Um, and they don't know necessarily how they apply that until maybe six months or two years after the experience happens. So mm -hmm. we also need to remember that sometimes the impact isn't happening until later on in someone's life. And so many ways to think about how are we considering the impact of the work that we're doing. Um, I think the other piece about this updated concept of the assessment cycle that is really important to me is uh, I feel a responsibility to the participants who are coming to engage in the intervention that we're delivering a meaningful experience to them. And so by continually being responsive to the data that we are receiving, it allows the programs and interventions to evolve over time to better serve the audience that you're intending to reach and to help better meet the goals that exist. And I think a, a pitfall of this is a lot of times we're collecting satisfaction data. So did you like that experience? Um, were you, did you enjoy the course that you took? And those are certainly mm -hmm. helpful, yes. And we know that sometimes in learning experiences, they're not fun. We don't like them. We are uncomfortable and, and that's okay. Um, to an extent, of course. And so how can you think about really drilling down on what do we want people to gain as a result of this conversation? And what are the many ways to measure that? Um, and that may be something that occurs after every intervention, or maybe you have a cycle on which your program, your unit, your staff, think about uh, a regular audit of the work that you're doing. Um, Something that for me has been really helpful is taking a curriculum map and applying that to a unit or a program um, and thinking about what are the goals that we have as a, as a unit and what are the programs and offerings that we offer on sort of a grid. And then being thoughtful about, well, where are those outcomes and goals showing up in the work that we're doing? And I think that in and of itself is a really important framework because if you have, you know, 10 goals for your unit and 25 programs, and of those 25 programs, they're only hitting four of the 10 goals, that's an opportunity to think about, are we duplicating our efforts? Are we best using our resources? Are we serving the participants that we have in a way that can um, maximize our opportunity for engagement? And so a curriculum map is a great starting point and something to revisit often. And it also is a resource that allows, I think, for really um, creative and strategic management of time and money as you all have, we all have limited bandwidth in the work that we're doing. And so what are ways that um, maybe you use your goal goals to frame what you're doing and when you're assessing it? So that's one reason why I think that this assessment slinky is such a valuable resource um, and way for us to sort of plan and, and steward time in, in a way that also makes impact assessment less of a checkbox in that um, you're not just doing it because you're supposed to at the end of a program, but you're, you're creating the space where the data can inform your practice and your work in a way that will be transformative over time and continue to evolve the work that we do. Um, so I guess that is sort of the, 
the big picture question framework and then the guiding questions that I thought we could spend some time thinking about are on the next slide. Um, so I think I, I was just was speaking to this kind of passion that I have for impact assessment in this work really being a thread in the fabric of our work as opposed to an add-on or an accessory. I think um, initially assessment might be um, thought of as, oh, it's just more to do, but really it can help lessen the load and be uh, help prioritize how we spend time and money and can be built in to a cycle. And so it maybe it's um, an every, every, an annual report is important. And if those annual reports are being written and put on a bookshelf, then are they as useful right. as they could be? And so what are the components of the annual report? And are there pieces of that that can then be brought back into practice more regularly? Um, Will writes in the chat about the, the use of the word political in assessment. Absolutely, right? And, and so then as you're engaging in assessment, what happens if there are data that show your program isn't achieving its goals? And what, what do you do, especially if that's a program that maybe is grant funded or um, is a priority for your institution or the leadership of your institution. And, and that's where, you know, you really need to sort of, we sit with, what does that mean? How do we make meaning of those data? And then sort of back to where I started and sort of the framework that I bring to this around a really critical lens of how do we make meaning of the data given the context of, of the work that we're doing, institutions that we're at, the power structures that may exist, maybe are there ways that we collected those data that could be biased or uh, maybe the program just wasn't great. And this is an opportunity to think about how can we identify then opportunities for growth and opportunities for change as an opportunity, not a failure. Um, and so being prepared for I think the assessment for me is really exciting because it just keeps providing opportunities to evolve and adapt a program um, rather than something that is the same as it always been, has been because it's the same as it always has been. Um, and with this, there's a piece in the Journal of Student Affairs inquiry from 2017 that I, the reference is later that we have, I'm happy to share. Actually, I probably can pull it quickly and put it right in the chat. Um, hmm. This is one of my favorite pieces and really frames how I even teach the assessment class that I teach at the University of Maryland, which is, um, you know, often when we think about assessment, like I said, it's sort of, you take a survey, you have means, you look at well, pre post, what is the difference in the means? Was there effect size? Is there standard deviation? All of that is good. And that is important. And that is one way to think about impact assessment and it's highly valuable. I use that often. And what are other ways that we can collect data? And those could be um, to get more stories and depth from folks, from individuals to hear how something has been helpful to them through a more qualitative approach. Um, it could be through a participatory action work where maybe if there's a community change project that's a, a part of your work that you're doing, how do you then engage with community partners and participants to understand the impact of the program in ways that maybe we can't quantify? Um, and so really thinking about the multiple ways that data do exist, I think are really important and part of my mission in thinking about impact assessment as more than a checkbox and what gets me really excited in thinking about the ways that this can happen. Um, and then again, um, and Kim maybe even heard me talk about this when we worked together at Maryland, but I really think of research as resistance and then sort of bucketed in with that assessment evaluation. And so being in higher education, I often think about how am I replicating the status quo um, by replicating systems of oppression in institutions that have been operating in, in ways that have been oppressive for years. And in some ways, research assessment evaluation are an opportunity to create that change and um, to find ways to use uh, data and evidence to help create change. And that's where the epistemological pluralism also ties in. And so if in higher education and student affairs and leadership work, 
uh, we embrace the, the leadership mission and vision of creating change, we can do that with really compelling data to show how come, how leadership programs can create transformative and meaningful experiences for participants and that mm -hmm. the impact can last over time. Um, in my work at the Aspen Institute, I'm fortunate to work with our youth leadership programs. Um, and we have sort of three, three programs that operate at various levels in working in community. One is a high school-based program that works with larger cohorts. One is a small high school-based program that works with about uh, 17 students. And one is a larger fellowship for college-age youth. And what has been really exciting in looking at the data that we have related to the experience that folks are having in that program is that um, their experience over eight weeks of our high school program, we are seeing gains across outcomes that are statistic statistically significant and on the range of sort of eight to 17 percentile points higher than when they started. And when we compare those data to national data that measure the same thing relative to one year of college, the average college student who's been exposed to a leadership experience does not have very meaningful gains across the board for right when we look nationally. Certainly we can disaggregate that and look at it in lots of different ways. Um, but where, how can we continue to find pockets of meaningful practice and then understand what is it that makes those experiences meaningful for participants? And then how can we help adapt that and expand that and scale that to continue to increase opportunities for access to high quality, meaningful learning experiences to really have, have the opportunity to create the change that we want to see in the world. Um, and I think that's what's really exciting about all of the different offerings that we have represented here with Leadership and the different programs that exist with the different uh, organizations and universities that you all represent you know, there are these pieces that are happening. How can we use data to tell the story of the impact to then continue to increase opportunity? And the sort of last question would be, um, I think impact assessment, like I said at the beginning, can often be seen as like, oh, more work I have to do. I already have so much. And it could potentially be an opportunity to ease workload, to reduce what uh, what we have in an, in an average week and can be an opportunity to help better serve stakeholders because it can help provide some guidance on, you know, maybe we don't need to do all 25 programs that we've always done. Maybe there's a way to think about timing and offering and um, either potentially an uh, argument to help increase staffing or maybe reduce some programs or change how we've done them as a result of the data that we can gather. Um, so those were all of the pieces. Abby, I'm going to let you see, take a pulse for where we want to go next. Well, I'm mostly just excited to get to use the term epistemological pluralism in my conversations from now on, because, <laughs> wow, that's a phrase. I love that. But I appreciate these guiding questions as a way to think about, like, how do you need to use this information and what is helpful, especially I think your point for me, Kristen, anyway, that point that you made around if the assessment that you take about how successful the course was isn't giving you the data that you need, is it because of when the course became available and what were the circumstances around the course? And I think so for so many courses that became available during this super weird time of pandemic, like is that information still relevant in the people that need? And then how do you use those assessment tools to figure out like, what do we need to do to move this course forward? Because the information is still valuable, but perhaps elements of it need to shift. So you don't need to scrap what you've done. But I think that this, um, this is, these are really helpful guiding questions and thinking about the work that we're doing. I'm not seeing questions in the chat, but maybe that is because people are like, oh, this is also really helpful for me and the work that I'm doing. So folks, do you have questions about these guiding questions? Do you have, is there anything that you'd like to hear more information around these before we move forward into the rest of Kristen's slides? Uh, 
maybe they're like me and they're like, yep, also going to be using that phrase this week. Very excited. I about do. That. I love it. I, 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 I live in this space of Adrian might like this term liminality, which is a word I love and hate at the same time, but that in between, um, and the jargon of epistemological pluralism is such a big jargon. And I have the definitions to review because I always need to review epistemology. Sure. And it really does. I think it's an example of how particularly in spaces of higher education, where jargon is so prevalent, um, it's a way to sort of take that jargon and use it to create change, which is why I get really excited. That paper is one of my uh, favorites that we use in the class I teach in the fall. That's great. Uh, Fantastic. I love Adrian's very supportive <laughs> comments of you here. Yes, for sure. Well, I did well, I think bring we're good. Yes. resources, so we can talk through those, and then maybe some of the extra slides I had at the end could be um, helpful just to think about just paradigmatic approaches, which again, more jargon, but also fun. <laughs> Another supportive comment from Adrian here in the chat <laughs> that she, she wished she took her assessment class with you. Well, thank you. We're having and fun. And for me. <laughs> That's um, great. So I, there, these are all free resources for folks to mm -hmm. use. And so NALOA is the National Institute for Learning Outcomes Assessment. Natasha Jankowski was executive director of that for a long time. I, there is a new person leading that work. Um, but one of the pieces that Natasha and Eric Montenegro uh, published out of the NALOA work was around um, having more culturally responsive assessment, and that has been a focus of the work of NALOA. Um, but they do offer some helpful resources related to thinking about um, entering assessment and also the curriculum mapping that I mentioned. They have some wonderful resources that you can download and look at for free, um, which I think is helpful. And then um, the Student Affairs Assessment Leaders is a coalition of folks who have been doing work in assessment, particularly in student affairs, who came together to say, like, how do we leverage our collective resources with one another? Um, it's a free organization for folks to join. They have uh, lots of information and resources on their website. Uh, Nicole, Dr. Nicole Long, who was in grad school with me, was the previous chair. I forget who the new chair is. And um, they have a listserv that's very active. So people are often asking questions of one another, sharing resources, um, posting jobs on that uh, listserv. The publication Journal of Student Affairs Inquiry comes out of the Student Affairs Assessment Leaders. And I think it's been a really great um, journal that is open source and available for folks to look at and find um, resources and also a space for publishing. And so if you all in your work are engaged in an assessment, in a way that you also then want to contribute back to the literature through a publication. It's a resource that is not necessarily as well known, but I think really fantastic. Um, and then, um, you know, I always think it's, it's resources on how to write research questions are helpful. And so you can find those at this George Mason University uh, Library Writing Center site. And then the American Association of Colleges and Universities does have their value rubrics that come out of the um, LEAP initiative, sort of connected with Nessie loosely and George Ku's work on high impact practices, mm -hmm. which we probably could have an entire session on sort of <laughs> working through and thinking about high impact for whom and what does high impact mean? Mm -hmm. And we, if we have time, we can maybe dig into some of that. But um, certainly, you know, some of those rubrics may or may not be helpful. And if you wanted to create your own rubrics, I did find this, uh, this last resource from Champlain to be helpful just in thinking about, you know, for the folks who are novice and beginning um, to just have a starting place, how you might create rubrics that might work for you if that is a helpful tool. Um, okay. And then I think the next couple slides might be helpful too to go through for folks who wanted like tangible takeaways. These are just references. I am um, the academic in me, the good practice of sharing them is important. Um, I'm sure there's actually a new edition of the Mertens book. It's one that I think there's a new edition every two years, but the, the core of it I think is helpful for folks who are kind of interested in multiple approaches to uh, research. And then if we go ahead two slides, I think, Abby, we'll get to learning outcome, maybe one behind it. Yep. So, um, oh, sorry. Okay. You're, that's great. So sorry. <laughs> I 
always struggle with um, writing learning outcomes myself and so have found that these resources that I will pop right into the chat because I have it easily accessible to do so. Um, there are sort of two approaches that are often the ABCD and then the SMART goals, similar but different. Um, ABCD is really, you start with who is the audience? What is the behavior? Under which conditions do we hope that the behavior will be practiced? And then to what degree will we see a gain? And so there's lots of great ways to think about how one might write learning outcomes in that way. And then the SMART approach is sort of similar to SMART goals. So what are the specific, measurable, attainable, results-focused, and time-focused? So similar to, um, to setting SMART goals, we would just adapt that for uh, learning outcomes. And then NALOA, as I mentioned before, they have helpful resources. And then maybe one of my favorite tools um, mm. are these verbs. So I have them in a share, I put in the chat, the verbs. So if you are sort of struggling with how, what are some of the um, words you might use to identify and write the learning outcome, there's lots of different verbs that you can use for that. And so what are knowledge verbs, comprehension verbs, application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. And so again, we could probably de debate, discuss, engage in dialogue around the value of Bloom's taxonomy as a taxonomic approach. And the verbs are very helpful when you're thinking about what you hope someone might take away from an engagement with a leadership program. Are there any great. questions or comments so far? Anyone want to share? I said to Abby and Vernon, I am not a professor by training. And so talking straight for 45 minutes is does not come naturally to me. So if folks have thoughts or comments, we're a small enough group that we probably could chat through any of these. I appreciate these as thought starters too. I think these verbs to use when writing learning outcomes, like um, I, uh, we haven't had to write learning outcomes at Leadership in a while. We writ, wrote, rewrote some in the early stages of the pandemic, certainly. But I think that like when you're getting started with something like this, that's probably the big kicker to get through is like, what do we need to assess here? And so being able to look at this list as thought starters to help you get that um, list pulled together is likely very helpful. I like thinking of the, um, that there's a smart learning outcomes that kind of couples up with smart goals. That's a, that's a process that so many of us are familiar with, with goal writing. And so using that same tool to write these learning outcomes, I think is a really helpful way to get that ball rolling as well. That's great. Yeah. Thank you, Abby. Yeah, of course. I know I, I did I skip a slide in getting here? Oh no, we got to the reference. No, we did that. Already. So now I was gonna say we can now okay. go into more jargon so that mm -hmm. you can, um, use it at your interest or not. Um, I always have to Google the ologies in, in terms of reminding myself <laughs> what they mean, except for methodology is the one I am most um, attuned with. I think uh, the paradigmatic outlines, and we can go through the next slide in more depth if folks mm -hmm. are interested, but this epistemological pluralism, I think is helpful in thinking about the sort of approaches to research that we see. And part of the, the goal I have in, in the work that I do around my mission of engaging people in this work is that all three of these approaches have great value. Um, there's just limitations to all of them too. And so being thoughtful about what are the frameworks, the epistemological assumptions and how these show up, I think are just helpful resources for us to use in, in making um, decisions about how we engage with these different approaches. And so um, the paradigm uh, is the, the top, uh, the columns, are, those are three sort of traditional paradigms used in educational research and assessment and evaluation. And the paradigm is the, the way of seeing the world, the worldview. This comes out of uh, Thomas Kuhn's 1969-1970 uh, 1970 publication to look at science actually. And some of you may be familiar with this piece, but he um, wrote a lot about, you know, in science, in sort of the, the biology, geology, 
um, physics, science spaces, there is often an assumption of fact and capital T truth. And what this work did was to sort of go back in time through history and look at what was in, in biology and in physics, capital T truth in the 1600s evolved into the 1700s and evolved and continues to evolve now. Um, and so that sort of notion, he really thought about as these paradigmatic shifts. And then uh, Mary Ellen McEwen and others brought this idea of paradigm into our work in education to think about what are the different ways that we can see the world in, in sort of the work that we do, particularly related to research. There are some paradigmatic purists who think that your way of seeing the world should drive the learning outcomes, the research questions, the way you collect your data. Um, and, and that's great. And there are folks who maybe are a little bit more like me and think about, for me, having sort of some understanding of and connection between these various approaches are really helpful for me to sort of, again, engage in that research or assessment as an opportunity to create change. And so in my own work, I have sort of used pieces almost like a cafeteria across the board out of all of these boxes to inform my, my own work. Um, and so I think often with that epistemological pluralism paper that I shared really talks about is when we're teaching assessment, when we think about assessment, we often, um, the, the global we, especially in education work, focus on that first, second column, the post-positivism, where the researcher is separate from the work, the, the data collector is separate from the, the data, um, the sort of IRB, institutional research board pieces kind of have an umbrella over all of this, certainly around um, respecting privacy and doing no harm. But the piece that is sort of characteristic of this approach is the uh, lowercase t truth, that there's one, one truth, a little bit more fact, fact-based in quotes maybe, um, but the quantitative approach to data collection of that pre-post intervention and we look. And, and I think that, you know, there's a great paper that I don't have offhand, but um, around strategic positivism of like, are there opportunities where using numeric data can actually help us achieve some goals that we have back to that, um, the political nature of assessment at the beginning. So if some of the goal is to change policy, how can we use some, um, some data that come out of this framework, maybe percentages or um, gains across uh, a numeric um, uh, scale could be helpful to accomplish goals that we have. I think where the epistemological pluralism piece really gets to is that we often don't explore these other ways of knowing as important resources in the assessment, evaluation, and research work that we are doing in the education space and are so important in the work that we do. Um, and the the middle bucket is the sort of constructivist or interpretivist approach where it sort of embraces a social construction of reality, most often seen in sort of a qualitative approach to research. So centering interviews or focus groups. In this space, the researcher will acknowledge, or it was a data collector, sort of using those interchangeably, will acknowledge their, their maybe uh, positionality, like I did at the beginning, how they came to the work, what their relationship is with the data. Um, but there's still a little bit of separation, and that's really what separates, I think, this constructivist approach from a more critical lens, which um, directly ties into issues of power, systemic contra uh, systemic context with goals of um, justice as an outcome of the work that is being done. And um, that the critical approach is my favorite approach. And I think it's the hardest to operationalize in the systems and structures in which uh, I exist in the work that I do. And the ways that the critical and transformative theoretical paradigmatic approach often show up are in um, critical quantitative approaches. So how can we disaggregate data and be really intentional about the ways that we are uh, norming data, the ways that we are analyzing data, and having ways we are asking questions to collect uh, quantitative data. There's also critical qualitative approaches. So some autoethnographies, uh, sister circle methodologies that are more community en engaged, uh, participatory action research, and then sort of mixed. And so, like I said, some paradigmatic or methodological purists are like, you either use qualitative methodology or quantitative methodology, but really there's space where both are helpful. And so 
um, the quantitative space will help us get some real breadth to understand patterns, to understand um, sort of that generalizability maybe, whereas the qualitative data can really give some depth and to get to stories. And ultimately for me, all of this is a way to really better tell the story of the importance of leadership work and the work that we all get to do and how do we help to continue to make that more um, relevant for folks, have it be more transformative and more meaningful. And so that the work that I'm doing now isn't the same work I was doing in 2003 when I started in the leadership space. And so hopefully there can be some, some evolution over time. Thoughts, Kristen, that's questions? great. I, I truly appreciate this work. I think that the ways in which um, assessment is so much a part of who you are and the work that you do, that even as you and Vernon and I were chatting before the session started, and you can casually ask questions like, well, what is the data show around that? And what, what data points are you collecting around that? I was like, wow, it's not just work that you do. It's like part of who you are. And it's part of the things that you're considering and looking at through this lens. So I truly appreciate your expertise here and the ways in which you share this information with us. So thank you for that first and foremost. Also, I see Courtney has a hand up um, with a question. So I do you mind if I stop sharing so that we can be oh, more great. I would love that. casual and informal here? So I'll go ahead and do that. And Courtney, what's your question? Hi, Kristen. Thanks Hello. so much for sharing with us. Um, always love to get to learn alongside you. Um, so I was curious, um, because I'm sure you have also encountered this in your extensive work. Um, I, I loved how you, how you brought up at the beginning and, and helped frame really kind of the multiple ways of knowing and assessing and, and how all of those can be valuable. Um, and I think I am like right there with you. Um, but I think I oftentimes as well run into challenges from folks who really want to see like the big data, right? Like the, you know, the quantitative, like things that, that can be bubbled up, you know, to large groups and, and generalizable. Um, and so I'm curious to hear your reflections on like, how might you balance, um, that um, with like some of the deeper ways of knowing and assessing, right? Like gathering like those stories, that qualitative um, data, the, you know, the, the single kind of story impact, you know, from students or the kinds of things that you can do in a classroom room or program um, that don't also don't feel quite like assessment as well. And that oftentimes are more just inviting to students, um, you know, other than a survey. So, you know, I think a lot about how we, how we balance that and how we can get other folks to, you know, valuable, value all of those ways of assessing. Yeah, that's such a good question, Courtney. Um, I think that there are many ways to think about uh, that I've approached this. One is um, what are the, the data that we already have? And so for, um, for courses or programs where you're collecting, where you're doing reflections as part of that, how can you use what you already have to think about finding ways of, of gleaning learning from that or capturing um, quotes from debriefing from different experiences. So hearing, hearing the stories and reading the stories based on what people are sharing already as part of their learning experience. Um, in terms of the, the need for the number data, I sometimes maybe lean into that maybe more than, than other folks would. So one thing that I was getting really excited about at University of Maryland before I transitioned over was really embracing some alumni data collection. Because again, as I mentioned at the beginning, so often we're looking for that immediate learning gain right after the experience. And so we don't always see that because a lot of times, especially with leadership, education, and development, the application of that is coming later in life. I mean, I often think about the Leadership Institute, Abby, of like, you know, we learn everything and when it's time to apply it in a simulation, all of a sudden we forget what we learned. And I think that mm -hmm. happens a lot with, um, in a college student setting. And so thinking about 
alumni data collection as an interesting opportunity to, to gather some of that impact data down the road of thinking back on your experience in college with this program, how are you applying that now? And for me, it serves as both a way to collect those data that are helpful in measuring the impact of the program, also as a way to prime folks for thinking about, oh, maybe that program did help me now. And as an alumni engagement tool, as a way to think about how do we bring in other stakeholders into this work that can maybe help us um, be advocates and, and collaborators and thinking about different ways of demonstrating the impact of the work that we're doing. And then I think the other flip side of that is we have to be really honest with ourselves, again, global we, of when we're doing something, but maybe it's not working. And I think that for me, my observation of higher education is really hard in student affairs for people to say like, this didn't work how we wanted it to, and maybe we need to change it. Um, so that's, I think, one part. And then the other part is um, maybe it's because I'm like the oldest of three and the way I've been socialized, I always wanted to get A grades. And so I maybe do extra. And so I would provide the quantitative data, but then also supplement with the additional data that I found to be more compelling and important with those stories and with those narratives as a way to either enhance what the numbers were saying or bring a different perspective to maybe what the, the numbers were saying with some of the other uh, types of data that could be helpful. I'm not sure if that answered your question at all, um, but those were some of the thoughts I had. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it, especially that last piece about some subversive or sneaky data. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> sneaky data. I love it. Any other questions from folks? I see many faces or names that I know and some folks that I don't, but please, um, I, as you can tell, I do like to talk about leadership and assessment. So if you ever wanted to just chat, I pop my email in the chat, feel free to reach out anytime, happy to hop on Zoom or call um, or meet up depending on location and, and brainstorm and think through and engage in dialogue about this conversation. Thank you for that, Kristen. I think the ways in which you um, share the knowledge that you have, I think that that's a nice thing that has come out of these um, virtual conversation series that it's the information isn't mine, the information is ours to share. And so I appreciate um, the way that you bring that into the way you talk about this, because it's a it's a difficult topic to talk about, or it can be a difficult topic to talk about as we think about like, the next layers of that assessment, the next layers of how you collect that information um, and how it can be most effective. So truly, truly thank you for that time um, and for the ways in which you share that information with us here. Um, for those of you um, who have stayed with us for the hour, thank you so much for joining us too, for the questions that you've asked and for the ways that you've been um, supportive of the conversation as well. Um, I do wanna share that um, Leadership is a not-for-profit organization. We'll continue to share these um, programs for free. We'll continue to look for more, more folks to um, participate in these conversations and to um, co-facilitate and to guide these conversations as well. So if you have a topic that you're interested in facilitating or just hearing more about, please let us know and we'll um, set up future sessions as well. Um, please um, make sure that you're connected to us either through social media or that you've checked out our brand new website that we just launched earlier this week. We've been kind of quiet about it yet, but we'll be launching our excitement about it very soon. Um, so you heard it here first, folks. Um, but thank you for joining us as we wrap up this. Uh, thank, thank you, Kristen. I appreciate that. Um, um, thank you for um, joining us as we wrap up this week of the virtual conversation series. Um, we'll be posting about that again um, for whenever we'll have that next week of conversations. I think we hope to do those throughout. Thank you, Courtney. I appreciate that. Um, as we do more of these conversations throughout the fall semester, we'll, you'll see that information in um, social media. And then if you registered for any of the sessions this week, you'll receive an email next week with links to all of the recordings from this week's session. Um, we'll post those into our YouTube channel um, and then share links with folks so that if you wanted to go back and watch it, if you've got someone in your office that you're connected to that wanted to attend and couldn't, then you can share those links out with folks as well. And then we can do an assessment 
on how many times each of those videos were watched or how many times it was shared um, because we are very interested in data and assessments and research as well. So thank you all for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your Friday afternoon and have a great weekend. Thank you. Good to see everyone.